kind of thought-provoking, huh? Sometimes that's the way people approach God. They'll take the parts that they like and they'll reject the parts that they don't. I heard recently about a celebrity who claims that she is now a Jewish Buddhist. I'm, I'm serious. That is increasingly what people think they can do. They'll take the parts of this they like and the parts of this they like and it doesn't make any sense. It, it really doesn't. So, and as we're talking about hell a little bit later in this series on the end times, this is one of those things that a lot of people don't like and so they just would rather take it out. But you really can't do that. In this series I've been sharing on the end times, um, this morning's a very relevant part of that because today we are focused on the two destinations that will be a part of the end time. Today I'll be sharing about hell. Next Sunday, as was mentioned earlier, I'll be talking about romance and then we'll finish up the series on the end times two weeks from today as we talk about heaven. And that is a sermon, that's a message that you're not going to want to miss because it'll be very, very encouraging. But I could make a really strong case for the fact that today's message is absolutely just as much needed as the, as the message on heaven. If you were picking the topic this, topic this morning, how many of you would instantly be encouraged if I said, today I'm going to be talking about heaven? Now, hard to get excited about hell. I mean, it's in Scripture, and like we talked about in the video, you can't pick and choose. It's, that's just not the right, you, you don't have the right to do that. And Scripture talks about hell. Talks quite a bit about it, in fact. Doesn't always use the word hell, but the concept is taught many times throughout Scripture. Uh, but a lot of people don't, a lot of people are not sure what to think about that. In fact, I have some statistics to put up. And I'm just curious of how close she'll get. Let's look at this first one. There we go. According to recent research, does anybody want to guess what percentage of Americans believe in heaven? We'll start there. 70, 75, 80, you're a little too high. 65, you're really close. 67% of Americans believe in heaven. Now, among evangelicals, we are part of the evangelical community. That is, we're Bible-believing. We, we, we believe that God's Word means what it says. We're serious about that. Anybody want to guess what percentage of evangelicals believe in heaven? 85, you're not there yet. It's higher. Heaven. We're still on heaven first. 98%, I wish it was that high, but it's not. But it is 90% of evangelicals believe in heaven. Yeah, exactly. That's, I don't understand why it's not 98. Okay, now, in the same survey, how many people do you think believe in hell? Now, this is the population in general. Okay, if 67% of Americans believe in heaven, how many, what percentage do you think believe in hell? Would you say? It's higher. 55, it is higher. The actual percentage is 61% also believe in hell. But most say you'd have to be really bad to go there. Now, how, what percentage of evangelicals do you think believe in hell? 100% now if 100% don't even believe in heaven you're not going to get 100% for hell. You're really close. 87%. This is based on Searchway from Lifeway in October of 2014. Now I've separated evangelicals in that group because that's people who take the Bible seriously. And contrary to what a lot of people think, evangelicals aren't primarily a voting block. They're a group of people who take God's word seriously like we try to do. Now just because we take God's word seriously doesn't mean we understand everything scripture has to say. And perhaps that's even more true when it comes to hell because hell is an emotional subject. I mean, it's scary. It is threatening. It is, well, it's dramatic. 
I remember hearing when I was a young pastor that you could tell how godly a pastor was by how often he preached about hell. There's only one problem with that statement. That's not what scripture says. It, it doesn't talk about the, you determine somebody's godliness by how often they're talking about hell. And there's, there's a lot of misconceptions both to the right and to the left when it comes to hell. Let me give you some facts about hell in this next slide. A common misconception many Christians have about hell is that it is spoken of much more in scripture than heaven, but that is not true. Anybody want to guess how many times the word hell is used in the New Living Translation of the New Testament that we are using if you're using our Pew Bible, and it's what I speak from. Anybody want to guess how many times the actual word hell is used in the New Testament, in the New Living Translation? It's more than zero. Seventeen, you are so close. The actual number is sixteen. Sixteen times. While the word heaven is used, does anybody want to guess how many times it's used? 260 times in the New Testament. Now, to be fair, sometimes hell is spoken of and the word hell is not used, like eternal judgment, eternal punishment, those kinds of things. So it's not as far distant as it might appear on the surface. And some of the times when it's talking about heaven, it's using the kingdom of heaven. But, but the point is, heaven is actually more the focus than hell is. So, but both of them are there. That's, that's the reality of the situation. Now, the Bible warns that we're, we don't want to go to hell. It presents it as a place that everybody would want to avoid. Anybody who understands the reality of hell doesn't want to be there. But not everybody understands that. Anybody want to guess who, who made this statement? I'll give you the quote, and you see if you can figure out who said this. I'll take heaven for the climate and hell for the company. Very famous author from Missouri, Mark Twain. Mark Twain was actually an atheist. Ted Turner, the media mogul, said, I'm looking forward to dying and going to hell because I know that's where I'm headed. Now, let me be really clear. Nobody who properly understands hell would ever make that kind of statement. It, it just wouldn't happen because it's, it's a very serious, serious thing. Let, I, I really admire C.S. Lewis. He was a theologian who lived in the last generation. He was uh, very, he was a very thoughtful, thought-provoking man. He wants, this is a situation that happened to him once, and I think you'll, you'll be able to relate. He was once told about an inscription on a tombstone which read, Here lies an atheist, all dressed up and nowhere to go. C.S. Lewis said, I bet he wishes that were so. You see, it doesn't really matter whether you believe or don't believe. Reality is reality. I don't have to believe that if I hit my thumb with a hammer, it's going to hurt. But if I hit my thumb with a hammer, it's still going to hurt. I don't have to believe that if I jump off a building, I'm going to hit the ground. But whether I believe it or not, I'm still going to hit the ground. Scripture is really clear Although many people say, I just can't believe in hell, the reality is scripture is abundantly clear that hell is a reality. Now, there's a lot of confusion about it. And so let's start with this principle. And this is the first point in your, in your notes if you're, if you're going to take notes. Hell is not popular, but it is real. I mentioned a few minutes ago that 61% of Americans believe hell exists, but almost none of them think they're going there because they believe you have to be a whole lot worse than they are to go to hell. And I kind of understand that because nobody who understands it would want to go there. It sounds so harsh and scary to the, to the average person. But let me tell you, it's real. It's genuine. They, people believe only murderers and rapists or perhaps adulterers and adulteresses will get there, but surely not someone like themselves. I want you to find Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 through the end of the chapter. I want to look at one lengthy passage from the New Testament in this first, first point. 
To make things more interesting, it's something that Jesus taught, so that brings it a little more to our attention. The passage is rather lengthy, and actually it starts off by talking about the fact that there will be a judgment, and there will be those who are rewarded for righteousness. Those are believers. And then he shifts gears, and he talks about those who will be punished for ungodliness. And he talks about hell and eternal judgment in that section. So if you have found the passage, let's begin reading with verse 31. You can follow along with me and then we will, we will look at the end of the passage. Really, I'm just giving you the first part to, let, to put the context, but we'll be focusing from verse 41 and on. Verse 31, But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit upon His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink or a stranger and show you hospitality or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Verse 41. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away from me, you cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your homes. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth. When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Now this passage makes really clear that there are rewards at the end of time for everybody. Now reward doesn't have to be positive. I remember when I was in the seventh grade, my math teacher said, the next person who talks in class is going to get a paddling. I didn't believe him. <laughs> he meant what he said the reward of me ignoring my teacher was I was taken into the hall and given some licks by the board of education as they used to call it I don't remember that was too long ago <laughs> but I remember the experience because it was humiliating and I remember the teacher saying, Tim, you're a good kid. Why did you talk? Well, because I didn't think he'd do what he said. But he did. I got rewarded for my misbehavior. But rewards also obviously go the other direction. In this passage, he talks about that very thing. I want you, Jesus talks about eternal fire. I want you to notice something. He said it isn't prepared for people... It was prepared for the devil and his demons. See that at the end of verse 41? People sometimes look at hell and they say, Oh, how would God prepare a place like this for people if he loves us so much? Well, actually the correct answer is it wasn't originally prepared for people. This hell was originally prepared for the devil and the demons. Now, there will certainly be people who are there as this passage makes abundantly clear. But it wasn't originally prepared for us. For people. So look at the next statement in your notes. Hell was originally prepared for Satan, not for people. Now it's obvious from the passage we've just read that people are going to go there, but that wasn't its original purpose. Everything Jesus says in this passage about hell points to how serious this is. He talks about judgment and the seriousness of, help, of not helping people in need. Notice the things specifically mentioned here aren't murder or rape or adultery. <clears throat> They are more sins of omission, things we didn't do. These are not the big sins. 
We would kind of expect it, if Jesus is talking about judgment and sending people to hell, that he would list the things that really bad people do. But he doesn't do that. He talks about the things that everybody here has done. Have you ever known somebody needed something and you were just too busy and you got distracted and didn't help them? If you've never done that, then you're a whole lot better person than I am because I sometimes get distracted and don't do everything I know I should. That's what's going on in this section. And Jesus says, listen, you didn't do these things to me. And they say, well, Lord, we would have helped you. And Jesus said, well, you didn't do it to the least around you. Then you didn't do it to me. So the standard is remarkably high when he talks about eternal judgment. Note specifically that these are very minor offenses from our point of view. You certainly don't see anything like the attitude of Mark Twain and Ted Turner in Jesus' discussion of eternal judgment, do you? I mean, nothing like it at all. In fact, Jesus was incredibly serious about the subject. He was very serious about hell. In fact, I want you to notice one more thing. Look at this statement in your notes. Hell is described by Jesus with the words, eternal punishment. Does does anybody here enjoy punishment? Anybody here ever had a ticket? Boy, did I get some smiles on that. How many of you enjoyed writing the check to pay your fine? Come on, put those hands up. Nice and high. I do not remember how much that spanking hurt, but I do remember I didn't enjoy it. Punishment is, by definition, unpleasant. But it's interesting here, as he's talking about punishment, he wants people to understand this is a really big deal. We need to understand what Jesus is teaching about it. And let, that brings us to the second point, the main point in, your mess, in the message this morning. I want you to also understand that hell is a very bad place. In this section, we're going to look at several different verses, and there's no lengthy passage, but we're going to move from verse to verse. This time, you're not going to look it up. It's just going to be on the screen. Let's start with this one from Revelation chapter 20, verse 1. Look at what it says. John writes, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit and a heavy chain in his hand. So, here's the first statement. Final judgment is described as a bottomless pit. How many of you are scared of heights like I am? It's been something I've struggled with from the time I was a kid. I've been afraid of heights. I fell off a bluff when I was a kid. I have scars still under my chin to to prove that I tumbled down this rocky hill. And ever since then, I have been scared of heights. How many of you can remember waking up in the middle of the night and you felt like you were falling? Ooh, it's a bad feeling, is it not? It's, it's a panicky feeling. You feel like you're falling and there's nothing you can do to stop. And then you wake up. But can you imagine that sensation? And you never wake up? It's not pleasant. Now, we're not going to spend much time on any of these. And I want to keep moving because the final section is where we're going to take a little more time. But I want you to, get the, the, uh, I want you to understand hell is, is not a good place. Let's look at a second passage. This one is Revelation 20 still. Same chapter, skipping down to verses 14 and 15. Here's what it says. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not recorded, found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So final judgment is described as a lake of fire. A bottomless pit sounds scary, but nothing like a lake of fire. Everybody here has been burned at some point, have you not? And there's nothing that hurts worse than a burn. I mean, it's so painful. But a lake filled with fire is incredibly frightening. It's horribly scary. Because lakes are normally full of what? Water. But the picture is, you know, of 20 or 30 feet deep of just flames. I mean, it's a... It's a disturbing picture, is it not? 
It was intended to be disturbing. Now, will there be literal fire in hell? Actually, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But scripture sure seems to indicate that there will. It is a scary, scary image. Let's look at the next passage. Luke chapter 16, verses 22 and 23. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23. And his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment... He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. So here, final judgment is described as torment. Do you see what I mean about each word building on the last to make hell even more horrifying? He started with the bottomless pit, the lake of fire, and then he describes the experience of those there as being in torment. Actually, it seems very appropriate when you look at all these words that torment would be an accurate word to describe what's going on. It implies pain, both emotional and physical. Let's look at one more passage. This one from Matthew 25, verse 46. And Jesus is again speaking and says, And they will go into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So final judgment is also described as eternal now, that's the most horrifying description of the whole thing. Because eternal means never ending. Never concluding. Never done. You know what, I don't even like talking about it, do you? I mean, it's just such a scary, horrifying thought that somebody might end up, not somebody might, millions will end up in this situation. So, I want you to understand, hell's not something to joke about. There isn't anything funny about hell whatsoever. It's a terrible, terrible place. I want to look at one final major point in the message, and this one I think you'll find interesting because we're going to talk about some unexpected things. Let's talk about hell is a misunderstood reality. In spite of the things we've studied so far, and most of you knew all these things, I want us to come to terms with the fact that there are some things about hell that are a bit unexpected. Most of you have heard about fire and bottomless pit and that hell's eternal. But some of the things I want to share in this final part of the message just might surprise you. Let's begin with this one. The person in the Bible that talks the most about hell and speaks of it using the most graphic language. Anybody want to guess which one of the prophets talked more about hell than anybody else in all of Scripture? You think it was Isaiah? He wrote 66 chapters. Or what about Jeremiah, the crying prophet? What about Peter? Peter wasn't a prophet, but he was very bold. Who do you think it was that talked more about hell and used more graphic language to describe hell than anybody else in all of Scripture? Actually, it was a name I didn't use. It was Jesus. Jesus, who is famous for his love and how he loves sinners, Jesus talked far more about hell than anybody else in the entire Bible. Far more. We think of Jesus standing over the woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery and saying, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. We think about Jesus being described as a friend of sinners. And he is all of those things. But he also taught a lot about hell. The things Jesus said about hell are very significant because he wants us to understand hell and that it's not a place you want to go. In fact, Jesus speaks specifically about hell with a lot of details 12 different times in the Gospels. 12 times. Imagine that. 12 separate times he talks in detail about hell. It was a big deal to Jesus. Let me show you something else that I believe will help us understand hell just a little bit better. It's going, to sound, it's going to look like I'm chasing a rabbit, but I'm not. The Valley of Gehenna was located on the south side of Jerusalem. Gehenna was the word Jesus used to describe hell 11 of the 12 times. 
Gehenna, during a number of Israel's most wicked kings in the nation of Israel, became involved in the worship of a Canaanite god called Molech. Anybody ever heard of the god Molech when you're studying the Bible? Molech was a particularly reputable Canaanite deity. And the way you worshipped Molech was by sacrificing your children to him. And guess where that took place? Gehenna. A valley on the southern edge of Jerusalem that people would literally take their children, slaughter them, and then burn them as an offering to this fake god, Molech. Now, eventually Israel walked away from that type of worship because it was so grotesque. And they returned to God at least in a limited way. But after they did, that section was turned from being a place of worship to a dump. And people would take their trash out of the city of Jerusalem and they would pile it in the valley of Gehenna and it would be burned there. And if, well in fact let's look at this. The Greek word Jesus used most often to speak of hell was Gehenna. It was, a place, it was the place in ancient Jerusalem where trash and unclaimed corpses were burned. So it was always on fire. If you wanted to go to the nastiest place in Jerusalem, you went to the Valley of Gehenna. Because there's always fires burning, and there's unclaimed bodies that are on fire, and there's trash that is continually burning. And that's the terminology that Jesus used to describe hell. It was particularly disgusting. However, as we look at the various misunderstandings about hell, we have to understand one reality that you might not actually think about in a message on hell. But it makes perfect sense and it's really necessary. I want to show you a passage that demonstrates that no one has to go to hell. You'll almost certainly recognize the words of John 3.16. Read them with me. For God loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. So I want you to understand that by Jesus' sacrifice, He made it possible so that no one has to go to hell. No one. That's what that will not perish means. When He talks about perishing, He's talking about being separated from God forever. Dying. In fact, that's what the word death literally means. It means separation. When we talk of physical death, it means we, our body is separated from the real person. When we go to the funeral home, we see the body, but the real person that we knew and loved is gone. Spiritually speaking, we have spiritual death. When we sin, our sin separates us from God. It's the idea of spiritual death. But perish here carries the idea of permanently being separated from God. But Jesus, by his death, made it possible for no one to have to, have to be separated from God. Now, many people have looked at God and said, it's, it's unthinkable that a loving God would send people to hell. Anybody ever heard that before? But the reality is that misses the point. God is a judge. He doesn't send people to hell. People make choices to reject him, and that is what sends them to hell. Not, not God. You can't legitimately look at a judge at a murder trial and say, you killed the man. No, the judge just passed judgment, meted out justice. God has done everything necessary to make it possible for everyone to come to Christ, for everyone to be able to enjoy heaven. He has, made, he has done everything possible to make it available, but he also gives people choice. He doesn't force people to come to him. He respects free will, and He makes salvation possible to every person, but He doesn't force anyone. Let me explain how that works. Because I don't have it perfectly, but I think I can explain in a way that you'll understand. Sammy is how old now? Two. Guess what happens if Sammy doesn't want to do something that his mom and dad really know he needs to do? Guess who wins that battle? No, not Sammy. <laughs> if he really needs to do it, what are John and Amy going to do? They're not going to say, now Sammy, 
we will do it your way this time. No, that's not what's going to happen. If it's really in Sammy's best interest, they're going to step in and say, you're doing it my way. Now, I have a 30-year-old daughter. If I disagree with something she does, I set her down and say, now, Johanna, you have to do it my way. I see parents nodding their heads, no, because that's not the way it works, is it? When they become adults, I have opinions sometimes that don't always line up with them, but I don't get to make the choices. I love all of my kids. They're good kids. I don't always agree with their choices. But I don't get to at 30 and 28 and 27 and even 18, I no longer get to come in and say, you're doing it my way. Hasn't every parent here experienced the same thing if you have adult children? Every single one of us. And if you haven't, <laughs> give it time. I guarantee you'll get there. Well, we did the same thing with our own parents, didn't we? You know, I'm 55 years old and I respect my parents and I often ask for their advice, but I'm still the final one who makes the decision of whether I will do what they say or go another direction. And frequently I will do what they say, but not always because they're not living my life. God makes it possible for every person to come to salvation, but he doesn't force the issue. He makes it available. But he doesn't force us to do what he knows is even best for us. So look at the next statement in your notes. Just as no one can legitimately be blame a judge who sentences a criminal, no one can legitimately blame God when he judges us because he has gone even farther in his commitment to merciful justice. Jesus has already taken our judgment. He already paid the price. That's what John 3.16 was about. The price has already been paid. If you are not a believer, it's not because the price hasn't been paid. It's because you didn't accept it. Perhaps this is the most important thing you're hearing about hell this morning. He took our judgments so that although we deserve to be judged and sentenced to hell, we don't have to be. Still, there'd be some who would say that in spite of how God took our just judgment, it doesn't seem fair that others will be tortured forever for rejecting it. Because if they understood fully, surely they would accept him. I'm indebted to a pastor by the name of Joel Smith for some of the thoughts he shared in a sermon titled, Would God Really Send Someone to Hell? He suggested that God doesn't actively inflict pain on people in hell. But if that's the case, then how do we deal with all the descriptions of hell? What about all the fire and brimstone? Now, I'm going to tell you in advance, I think there will be fire in hell. But I think it's not the primary focus. Let me give you an example. In Revelation 19, Scripture talks about Jesus returning with fire in his eyes and a sword in his mouth. Now, there is a lot of figurative pictures in prophecy. Okay, anybody who does prophecy, there's a lot of figurative language there. Does it mean Jesus is literally going to have fire coming out of his eyes and a huge sword coming out of his mouth? Probably not. It probably speaks of his judgment. So I think some of the description of fire about hell is picture of God's judgment. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks about our, our works will be tested with fire. Fire pictures judgment. How God judges us to determine what's right and what's bad and what's good. Now, am I suggesting that hell will not be a place of torment? Absolutely not. But here is what many conservative scholars have, have kind of thought plays a role in this. Separation from God will make hell the most horrible place imaginable. God is hope. God is love. God is peace. God is joy. Basically, God is everything good. And his influence is felt in this world. In the present world, even those who don't accept God regularly benefit from his goodness. For instance, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 5.45. Look at it on the screen. In that way, you'll be acting as true children of your Father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. The point is, even if you're someone who rejects God, you get the benefits of his blessings. Because he blesses every person with the basics. Health. Not every person is healthy, but he gives us bodies. He blesses us with air to breathe. We have food to eat. We have water to drink. There are blessings that just by being a human being, you are the recipient of God's blessings. 
The point is that the good things of God are given to those who are good and also to those who are evil. However, all of that ends in hell. We cannot begin to imagine what life would be like when God removes all goodness of His presence. That's how evil, that's how bad things will be in hell. Separated from God, things will go from bad to worse. Apparently sinful desires will, be, will follow people in hell. Whatever eats at you now will consume you there. Now, I'm not sure how this is in full measure, but it's probably at least part of what's, what hell's going to be. Listen to C.S. Lewis. Again, really a reputable, reputable teacher. Here is what he says, and this is actually in two cells. And we're right at the end of our time. Here's what he said. Christianity asserts that every human being lives forever. Okay? Whether we are in heaven or in hell, we live forever. There are many things which wouldn't be worth bothering about if I lived 70 years, but which are very serious if I live forever. Perhaps my temper or my jealousy may increase so gradually in 70 years that it's not very noticeable. But it might be absolute hell in a million years. In fact, if Christianity is true, hell is the precisely correct term for what it would be. So at least part of the terror of what hell is going to be is that in hell you will become the very worst version of yourself. Do all of us have some dark spots in us? Yes, we do. In hell, when God's presence is removed, not only is there the punishment, and I actually do believe there will be, there will be fire, and I do believe that. Although some conservative scholars say it's the judgment which is carried out in simply allowing us to become our worst person possible and tormented by the evil part of our personality. I try to be a decent person, don't you? But I have some flaws. You know, this is always a little disturbing as a pastor when I make a statement like that and everybody looks at me and nods. About the flaws. Yeah, about the flaws. But you see, I'm looking at all of you as well. And although I love all of you, you're all flawed too. We all have flaws. I don't want to become the worst version that Tim Richards could be. You don't want to become the worst version of yourself either, do you? Because all of us... You know what? I've lost my temper a few times in my life. And I don't usually struggle with my temper, but I've lost my temper a few times and said things that I later regretted, haven't you? At least part of the terror of hell will be that you will become the person you do not want to be consumed by your flaws. And that would be torment, would it not? Especially when it's combined with everything else that hell is going to be. That's the reason God warns us, all of us, to avoid hell. Because he doesn't want anyone to end up there. How many of you have ever flown on a commercial airliner? Okay. I want you to put yourself there for a second. I'm the flight attendant. You need to put your seatbelts on, you need to look up above because there is, a, there is a bag that will drop down if we hit turbulence. And they go through all these things and what, they're going, what you have to do if they would have to go, if they would have to crash land and where the, thing, the flotation devices are. What do people do during that time when the flight attendant is going through all that stuff? They read magazines, they read books, they listen to music. How many people, have you ever looked around during that spiel and noticed how many people are paying attention? Okay, now I heard a few of you say, I watch. But most people don't. Most people, do you know why they're doing that? Because they don't think it's going to happen. And they're usually right. Because 999 flights out of 1,000, there's nothing that happens at all. I don't mean they go down. I mean 999 out of 1,000, you know, they don't hit major turbulence. They, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just pretty routine. You go from here to there. You're cramped. You get pretzels and a little glass of soda. You sit beside somebody who snores or, or drools or, I mean, you do, you know. But 99% of the time, there's no major problems in the flight, so people don't pay attention. But hear what I'm getting ready to say. But out of a thousand people who live, a thousand people die. 
And of the thousand people who die, a thousand people will eventually stand before God and be judged. And they will either go up or they will go down. There are no other alternatives. We don't listen on the airplane because most of the time it's not going to happen to us. But when God talks about hell, we need to pay attention because everybody is going to be judged by God, either blessed with eternity in heaven or doomed to eternity separated from God. There are no other choices. Now, I have seen pastors manipulate people with the truth. I was really disgusted one time by a pastor friend of mine who preached to eight-year-olds about hell. And man, did he make it hot. By the time he got finished, every kid there was getting saved, even though they didn't understand. That's not what I'm talking about. But the reality is, hell is a real place. Millions, billions will suffer there forever. And God... Jesus talked about it because he doesn't want people to go there. He has he paid literally everything it took to make it possible for every person to miss that horror. But we still have to accept what he's done for us. In fact, if there's anything that I could tell you that is the real point of this whole message, one final statement in your notes, here is what it is. This is the most important thing I can tell you about hell. The most important thing you can know about hell is that you absolutely don't have to go there. You absolutely don't. He has already paid the price for you to miss it. He's already done that. The price is paid in full. It's done. You just have to accept it. If you're here this morning and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if he has not forgiven you of your sin, you need to, you need to take care of that this morning. You need to come to him you need to place your faith in Him and His sacrifice for you to make you His child. You need to do that this morning. This is not something worth risking. If you don't know for absolute certain that you have done that, take care of that this morning. I don't want any of you to end up eternally judged when the price has already been paid. Would you bow your heads with me, please? God, thank you that you have already paid the entire price. There isn't any part of the price you haven't paid, God. You took our guilt. You died in our place. You made it possible for each of us to be your child. And God, as we'll talk about two weeks from now, you're preparing a place for us that is going to be beyond belief. God, I pray that you would help us to understand the reality of eternity and to serve you faithfully because we know you looking out for us not only in this lifetime, but for eternity as well. God, if there's anybody here who does not know you, I pray that you would touch their hearts with these truths today and that they would accept you as their Savior. In your name I ask these things.